Hello and welcome to my ongoing series, Creating My Own Car Brand. This is episode 2. If you want to learn the basic history of my brand, Phoenix Motors, check out part 1. Link will be in the description below. But without further ado, let's explore some more fictitious cars produced by this fictitious company. As voted on by you wonderful viewers on my community tab, today's vehicle of choice was the Phoenix Vulcan, a fastback coupe. As we previously found out, Phoenix was thriving in the 1960s. In fact, in 1967, they decided to launch their very own muscle car to compete with the big boys over in America. The resulting car would be the Hurricane. And while the Outsider initially sold very well, it never came to the UK. Phoenix did have a few sportier offerings on the lower end of the scale in the European market, but not long after the Hurricane launched, Phoenix set out to create a European take on the car to be the new flagship. They were spurred on when rival Ford would do something similar, when in 1969 they launched the Ford Capri, a fastback coupe to be the European counterpart to their American Mustang. Fastbacks in the age of low fuel costs and the horsepower wars were insanely popular, and so Phoenix's new model was to fit this description. Numerous prototypes would begin emerging throughout 1969, and in October of that year at the British International Auto Show, the Phoenix Vulcan would be unveiled for the first time, featuring a distinct fastback silhouette. The name is a reference to the Roman god of fire, also being a shortened version of the word volcano. This theme of fire and smoke alluded to the power underneath the bonnet. Initially, the Vulcan was offered with two power plants, a V6 in 2.6 litre, 3 litre and 3.4 litre guises, and the Top Dog, a 4 litre V8, using a smaller version of Phoenix's Oakwood V8, first seen in the Hurricane a few years earlier. The V6 would produce 139 horsepower as the 2.5, 151 horsepower as the 3 litre, and 168 horsepower as the 3.4 litre, while the much larger V8 would throw out 236 horsepower. Unlike the Ford Capri, which was marketed to a wider audience using a lot of lower displacement engines, the Vulcan was seen as a true range topper, and so initially solely featured these higher displacement engines, though a smaller four-cylinder engine would follow around a year later. Sales began in February of 1970, and Phoenix would embark on a huge marketing campaign, both in the UK and in international markets. The Vulcan V6 was even briefly exported to Japan, but sales were never strong here, where the comparatively huge V6s were rather out of place. The V6, however, was the preferred version in the UK. The V8, exclusively seen in the Vulcan X30, while popular as the spearhead of the marketing campaign, was not the sales hit that Phoenix had hoped in its home market. However, the V8 fared much better in the international markets, and in 1972, the 500 unit limited run Vulcan V8 Komodo would be exported to Australia and the United States, featuring a 4.6 litre version of the V8 producing 294 horsepower, coupled to a 4 speed manual. With a 0 to 60 time of just 6.5 seconds, it was ultimately one of the fastest production Vulcans ever put on sale, easily identifiable by the V8 badges and the Komodo crest on the sides. Around this time, the Vulcan would also start being seen in certain branches of motorsport. In 1971, the car would premiere under the Group 2 rule set, powered by the 3.0-litre V6. It was primarily competed in the European Touring Car Championship, recruiting German driver Stefan Honigsberg, who had seen some previous success in touring car racing and in races such as the Targa Floria. Despite a rather lacklustre first year of competition being played by numerous breakdowns and mechanical issues, 1972 would be a roaring success for the team, seeing them take wins at a majority of races in their class, and in this version of the universe, Phoenix and Honigsberg would win the 1972 European Touring Car Championship ahead of rivals Ford, BMW and Alfa Romeo. The car also saw use in the British Saloon Car Championship, using largely the same engine and setup, being driven by British driver Rhys Barrett, who did have some previous experience with Phoenix. They ended up placing second in the 1971 season, though did claim victory in class. It also raced in the German DRM series, 
but was never able to compete against the front-running Fords. The following few years after this would prove to be a turning point for Phoenix and their fastback. First late came 1973, and with it, everyone say it with me, the oil crisis. Prices of fuel go up, and the less people want to buy and drive fuel-thirsty cars. The Vulcan, with its range of V6s and V8s therefore, was looking down the barrel of the gun. However, it marched on, and in 1975 the second generation of the Vulcan would debut, featuring updated bodywork and styling, a new interior, some updated mechanics, and some new engine options. This was when the Vulcan V8 would meet its end, foreseeing the monumental toll the oil crisis was going to ravage on the car industry over the next few years, Phoenix opted to drop the more powerful engines in favour of more economical options the average driver may prefer. They would therefore expand the range of the four cylinders offered, a 1.5, a 1.8 and a 2 litre. In fact, the 2 litre would see a turbo be added for the Vulcan TR that went on sale in 1976, producing 132 horsepower, being rather a nippy little beast. The 3.5 litre V6, with the absence of a V8 option, was now marketed as the top trim level, being slightly detuned to 145 horsepower. However, as covered in the previous episode, Phoenix seemingly didn't plan well enough for the years following the oil crisis, and the company quickly found itself being drawn closer and closer to bankruptcy. Cars like the Vulcan and the American market Hurricane were the main sources of contention. It wasn't the swinging 60s anymore, and people weren't as eager to buy up muscle. However, due to the Vulcan already being offered with a number of more economical powerhouses, it was saved from the guillotine with the bright idea of pushing the car's ad campaigns more extremely towards the realm of economical viability. Its American cousin, which would have required far more investment to develop and produce suitable power plants, was not so lucky, and the last hurricane would roll off the production line in November of 1974. But that's a story for another day. And so, despite the car attaining its range of V6s, Phoenix would advertise the Vulcan primarily as an inexpensive, reliable, commuter-friendly car that managed to retain a distinct sense of sportiness, the ad campaign adopting the tagline of the best of both worlds. However, it's not as though Phoenix entirely abandoned the Vulcan's sporty roots. The Mark II Vulcan would again see use in motorsports, this time used more as a weapon in advertising. It would pick up where the Mark I left off, again competing under the Group 2 European Touring Car Championship starting in 1975, and would go on to take second in the 1976 season, and another championship win in 1977 in the hands of German driver Franz Schwarzmann, in this universe interrupting BMW's dominance with the 3-litre CSL. More interestingly, Phoenix decided to test the Vulcan's performance in the new and outrageous Group 5 category. Group 5 was effectively the top level of competition for race cars based on production cars, with very... how do we put it? Uh, relaxed rules? Therefore, Phoenix contracted small British racing team Harbinger Racing to begin development on a new Vulcan Group 5 racer for 1976 their eyes primarily set on competing in the World Championship for makes and the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which was to use both the Group 5 and 6 categories in the 1976 season. The car was almost entirely redesigned, seating much lower and featuring more extreme bodywork than its road-going counterpart, and sharing few parts. It featured a turbocharged version of the 3-litre V6 producing 450 horsepower. The Group 5 Harbinger Vulcan would debut at the fourth round of the 1976 World Championship for makes. However, as the Vulcan was competing in Group 5, there was one big problem. It would be going up against the almost unbeatable Porsche 935, which had very quickly proven its superiority over everything else in class. Still, there were high hopes for the Vulcan, which proved more than a match for BMW's entrant, the 3.5-litre CSL. Phoenix, despite winning a sole round of the championship at Watkins Glen in the hands of Vulcan veteran Stefan Honigsberg, was able to take third in the championship, trailing closely behind BMW, reliability being the main issue with the car. And even at the prestigious 24 Hours of Le Mans, problems with reliability would plague the car, and all three Vulcans would not make it to the finish in the 1977 race. 
In 1978, a modified Vulcan Group 5 would debut, featuring a new twin turbocharged variant of the V6 producing 550 horsepower. While efforts were made to increase its reliability over the 1977 Vulcan, it was still a persistent problem, with many races throughout the season seeing DNFs. While not winning a single race this year, the lack of competition from other brands placed Phoenix once again in third behind Porsche and BMW. Le Mans, however, would fare much better for the team. The number 93 Vulcan of John Matthews, Pierre Corby and Leonard Barker would be one of the only other Group 5 class racers to have a qualified finish alongside the 935, placing an impressive third in class. The Group 5 Vulcan would continue to be raced under the Phoenix Harbinger team for a number of further years, only claiming a further two outright wins in the World Championship for Mix, though never seeing any class wins at Le Mans. Factory support for the Group 5 Vulcan would end in 1980. Around this time would also spell the end of the Vulcan itself. While sales were initially strong at launch in the early 1970s, by the later 1970s sales were dropping off. The 1973 oil crisis and the generally shifted market meant that the Vulcan was no longer the pride of the Phoenix fleet. The attempted rebranding throughout the decade to make the Vulcan appear more economical did bolster sales, at least for a little while, however it was not enough to keep it from the pit. With new models such as the Ashos and the Alcyon taking centre stage, the Vulcan was simply past its sell-by date, and so after 11 years on the market, the Phoenix Vulcan would meet its end. Now technically that's the end of the story for the Vulcan, however in the later half of the 1980s, Phoenix and the economy was in a much different position to when the Vulcan last graced dealership floors. The 80s had brought a revitalised love for rorty, flashy sports cars. The likes of the Mazda RX-7, the Nissan Silvia and the Pontiac Fiero were all examples of more grounded brands putting sport back on the map. And Phoenix knew that they were going to have to get in on it. They did have some experience in recent sporty outings such as the Ashros Turbo and the GTI, but they now wanted to develop a new standalone sports coupe to top their lineup. While plans were initially drawn up to make this a Mark III Vulcan, it was later decided that this new coupe was to be its own thing, more of a spiritual successor to the Vulcan. However, what launched in 1987 was unlike anything Phoenix had put out before. The name Pretheus was chosen for this new sports coupe, a subtle nod to the name Vulcan. However, instead of being the Roman god for fire, this name was instead a shortened version of Prometheus, the Greek god of fire. And the name certainly fit. Sleek, smooth lines, sharp corners, and as with most sporty offerings from the 80s, pop-up headlights. Engine-wise, it was pretty standard for the time. A 1.6-litre four-cylinder, a 2-litre, a 2-litre turbo, a 2.5-litre, and even a couple of V6s in 2.6-litre and 3-litre displacements, putting power down through a four-wheel drive system, though a front-wheel drive powertrain would launch in 1990. Unlike the Vulcan, the Pretheus was fairly quote-unquote toned down, featuring softer suspension and a smoother ride, typified by the convertible trim which was introduced in 1989. When the Fosha launched in 1992, it and the Pretheus would form a big part of Phoenix's image in the 1990s, with the Pretheus being the bigger four-wheel drive cousin to the smaller, lighter Fosha. However, despite this sporty heritage, the Pretheus never saw much of a factory back presence in motorsports, largely due to Phoenix focusing on separate sporting endeavours at the time, though it would see considerable use in local rallying, track racing and even things like time attack events and drifting events. The Pretheus would later also become very popular in the modern scene, with the aforementioned wide aftermarket support and easy maintenance, the 80s styling also going a long way in aiding its popularity. This popularity was largely in contrast to the Pretheus's time on the market, especially going into the 1990s. Sales would slowly decline as the new decade progressed, and in 1994, after just seven years on the market, the Pretheus would be quietly killed off, disappearing around the same time as other European sports coupés such as the Audi S2 and the Porsche 928. The Fosha would of course last until 1997, until that too would die off. 
Still, with so many sold in its first few years on the market, and a fairly strong showing in some international markets, the Pretheus remains readily available for enthusiasts, with there even being a planned Resta mod project for the future being announced in 2021. The Vulcan, and to a lesser extent the Pretheus, represented Phoenix's ability to push the boundaries and break rules, therein building two names that to this day remain as some of the company's most iconic. Thanks for watching guys, just remember pretty much everything in this video is made up entirely, so don't go on Auto Trader after this looking for an old Phoenix Pretheus as a project car, because it doesn't really exist. Like I said in the first episode, while it is really fun to come up with this stuff, it takes a lot of time and effort, probably 3 or 4 times as much as any of my other videos. That being said, a like goes a long way, and if you enjoyed the video, let me know if you want an episode 3. Plus, if you wish to view any of the mock adverts, or newspapers, or magazine covers that were in this video, there is a link in the description below to a folder containing all of them. And a very special thanks to Ben Wright and Brum Brum Brin, who are very generously donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. Just £1 a month is an amazing help, and I also have socials, which are linked in the description below. Again, thank you for watching, and take care.